Welcome everybody to our 12th session of Journal Watch. My name is Dr. Leonie Herx, and today we'll be joined by our co-host, Dr. Sharon Watanabe, and guest panelist, Dr. Braden Debroni. Next slide, please. The Palliative Care Journal Watch is a regular series of webinars that keeps you up to date on the latest peer-reviewed palliative care literature. This program is led by experts from several divisions of palliative care and palliative care medicine across Canada and internationally. Our team of academic clinicians is on the lookout. We regularly monitor over 30 journals and highlight papers that have the potential to challenge us to think differently about a topic or confirm our current practices in palliative care. Next slide. The Palliative Care Echo Project is part of, sorry, the Palliative Care Journal Watch program is part of the Palliative Care Echo Project, which is supported with a financial contribution from Health Canada. This project aims to cultivate communities of practice and establish continuous professional development amongst healthcare professionals across Canada who care for patients with a life-limiting illness. Next slide, please. In terms of what to expect from today's session, we will highlight and discuss our top four article selections and provide a list of honorable mentions at the end. These honorable mentions are articles that we thought were noteworthy, but due to time constraints, we aren't able to discuss them with you today. This session is being recorded and will be emailed to all registrants within the next week. Please use the Q&A function to ask questions of our panelists for each of the articles and feel free to introduce yourselves using the chat function. The recording of each webinar, the accompanying slides and links to the articles covered will also be available on our website. You can listen to our sessions through the Palliative Care Journal Watch podcast, which can be found wherever you listen to your podcasts. This is a one credit per hour group learning program that has been certified by the College of Family Physicians of Canada for up to eight main pro plus credits. Each one hour session is worth one main pro credit. I'm Leonie Herx, and I'll be co-hosting today's session. I am the Section Chief of Pediatric Palliative Medicine for Alberta Health Services, Calgary Zone, the Director of Rotary Flames House, Children's Hospice and Palliative Care Services, and a Clinical Professor at the Cummings School of Medicine. I'd like to Dr. Sharon Watanabe and then Dr. Braden Debroni to introduce themselves. Hello, I'm Sharon Watanabe. I'm a palliative care physician based at the Cross Cancer Institute in Edmonton. And I also am on faculty uh, with the Division of Palliative Care Medicine in the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry at the University of Alberta. Hi, I'm Braden Debroni. I'm a palliative care physician with the WRHA Palliative Care Program in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Um, I finished up a plus one year of training in palliative medicine uh, in 2020 after doing a family medicine background. Uh, so I work with the uh, yeah, uh, academic department uh, with the University of Manitoba for palliative medicine. Great, and we're excited to have uh, Braden here today. Is one that we've had the University of Manitoba recently join us as the contributing division. So it's uh, great to have you join for your first journal watch today, Braden. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, that is the disclosure slide. Great. Uh, in terms of disclosures, Palin Canada is a not-for-profit organization that has received funding from Health Canada. Aside from the funding from Health Canada, Pallium also generates funds through its uh, sales of the Pallium pocketbook and course registration fees. And our, our own disclosures are listed here on the slide. I receive a stipend from Pallium Canada for research work on the Canadian Atlas of Palliative Care. And Dr. Sharon Watanabe and Dr. Braden Debroni have no conflicts of interest to declare. All right, so let's get to it. Today we have four featured articles across a very interesting spectrum of uh, palliative care interests. So the first one is looking at anxiety and depression in metastatic cancer, a critical review of negative impacts on advanced care planning and end-of-life decision-making with some practical recommendations. Next, we're gonna talk about acute palliative care units, a scoping review done by Eduardo Barrera. Thirdly, we're going to talk about the impact of dosing of a very common medication we use across palliative care, dexamethasone, and look at corticosteroid-related adverse events. And lastly, we're going to have a very interesting discussion about machine learning in uh, allocating palliative care consultations during cancer treatment. So we'll get right to it. Over to Dr. Watanabe. Uh, 
All right, so I get to lead us off with this uh, study from a group of researchers in Colorado looking at the impact of anxiety and depression uh, in the context of metastatic cancer on uh, decision making, advanced care planning, um, and uh, associated with some practical recommendations. So the premise for this paper is that anxiety and depression are highly prevalent, prevalent in patients with advanced cancer and their caregivers. Some studies suggest that up to one third of patients with advanced cancer and up to a half of their caregivers have clinically significant anxiety and depression. And this has a potential to have an impact on advanced care planning and end of life decision making. So the goal of these researchers was to understand the impacts of anxiety and depression on advanced care planning and end of life decision making in the context of advanced cancer. So the methodology that they use was uh, what's called a critical review framework. So what these authors realized is that the number of studies looking at uh, the association between anxiety and depression on advanced care planning and end of life decision making is at the moment quite limited. So they would need to actually look at the broader literature on the impact of anxiety and depression on decision making in general, and then uh, looking at the association with um, decision making in a general healthcare context, and then honing down to those uh, smaller number of papers looking at the uh, metastatic cancer context. So um, because of the small size of the literature, they could not do a systematic review or meta-analysis. So uh, for the source of the papers included in their study, they looked at three databases that span um, oncology, psycho-oncology, and uh, uh, mental health literature. And they did two separate searches. The first one was looking at um, uh, conceptual or review articles on uh, decision making in the context of anxiety and depression, and not specifically in the healthcare context. And then uh, in their second search, then they were trying to identify those studies that were in a healthcare context and also in that subgroup in um, cancer, the cancer context. So by the end of their search process and, and filtering through uh, the studies, they ended up with 219 separate articles. And these articles were read and analyzed by a multidisciplinary team that had uh, relevant research and clinical experience in this area. Next slide. So um, what they found, and, and, and uh, there were quite a, a number of findings that were uh, described in the study, uh, and, and we'll hit some of the highlights, uh, uh, but I think at the end of the day, the, um, the main focus is going to be on uh, some of the tables that uh, uh, had some practical recommendations. Uh, and on this slide, I didn't include some of those more conceptual findings uh, from their broader literature review, but in general, what it boils down to who is when someone is anxious, uh, they have a heightened perception of threat, and that leads to avoidant behavior. And when someone is depressed, that leads to uh, lack of motivation uh, in decision making and follow through. Uh, and uh, so it leads to inaction. So that's sort of the, the general concept. So next on the slide, we have uh, the specific findings looking at um, the general healthcare context and the cancer specific context. So in the general healthcare context, uh, there are studies that show um, people who have a high level of anxiety will in fact uh, tend to avoid having advanced care planning and end of life uh, decision um, uh, making conversations. And uh, uh, interestingly, if they're moderately anxious, that actually motivates them to take to engage in this but if they're highly anxious it's a deterrent and then for uh, those uh, persons who are depressed uh, they are 
less likely to follow through with medical recommendations, be that with medications or some health behavior or uh, going through uh, some uh, diagnostic procedure. So that's um, the general context. And then they go into the cancer-specific studies in a bit more detail because there aren't many studies. Uh, and what one consistent finding is that um, uh, patients who are ex experiencing anxiety or depression prior to a consultation or to, uh, to some sort of a treatment or procedure, uh, there is a, a tendency to regret the decision after that consultation or treatment or procedure. And also they have a, a sense of dissatisfaction of being feeling unsupported uh, uh, or uh, inadequately informed in their uh, decision making. Now for caregivers, there was one study uh, in the ICU context where caregivers who were anxious or depressed had a preference for passive decision making. Uh, but this was uh, caregivers and not all the patients involved uh, had cancer. Other studies have looked at the impact of death anxiety. So uh, worrying about death uh, on advanced care planning and uh, end of life decision making and show that patients with death, death anxiety do have lower rates at advanced directive completion or discussion of their end of life wishes. And on top of that, they're more likely to have a discordance between their preferences for care and what they actually receive. Uh, and then finally, anxiety does have an impact on uh, patient uh, healthcare provider communication, uh, leading to uh, lower levels of trust uh, in their physicians, uh, less um, comprehension of uh, the information and um, and it can be bi-directional as well if patients are anxious and reluctant to discuss these issues and then physicians themselves may be uh, reluctant to to have that communication so those were their their findings so in their discussion what they say that their um, uh, their study does uh, confirm that anxiety and depression can lead to less engagement and satisfaction with advanced care pa uh, planning, cancer treatment, and end-of-life decisions. And so they advocate for, uh, in the moment, using some strategies to shift that negative emotional cognitive state of the patient and or uh, the caregiver before launching into that advanced care planning and end-of-life uh, planning discussion and decision-making. Uh, so while it's still important to assess the anxiety and depression uh, uh, themselves and, and address that. Sometimes, um, you know, you have to make a decision in the moment and that doesn't allow you time to uh, uh, comprehensively address the uh, person's emotional state. And so uh, what they include in their paper are three tables uh, that have practical recommendations and sample scripts for reducing uh, anxiety and depression symptoms and biases. So, um, so the first table is uh, uh, um, for patients who are anxious or depressed. Second table is for those patients who have uh, uh, social anxiety. Uh, and then the last table is for uh, patients who have um, uh, uh, trauma-related uh, distress, uh, PTSD. Next slide, please. So the strengths is that they have done a pretty good job, I think, of, of uh, uh, summarizing quite a broad ranging literature on anxiety and depression and uh, decision making. And it sounds like their team does have uh, the appropriate uh, experience to do the analysis. And I think that the, the big strength um, from my perspective is uh, the, that they came up with these practical recommendations and a script. Um, the limitations are that, uh, as they uh, stated, there are very few studies in the advanced cancer context. And in fact, many of the studies that they quoted uh, in the cancer context were in patients with early stage disease rather than advanced disease. So there is a fair bit of extrapolation uh, from other contexts. Uh, nonetheless, I, I think that um, in 
uh, are in clinical practice, uh, I believe that we all encounter those patients who uh, are not engaged in or difficult to engage in advanced care planning and end of life decision making uh, conversations. And I certainly in, in our own clinic here at the Cross Cancer Institute, we tend to get uh, refer those patients who have more uh, emotional or psychological distress, and 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 some of those patients are are very difficult uh, to uh, engage in those conversations despite repeated efforts. So uh, I am going to uh, myself try out some of these suggestions uh, in uh, in the paper. Um, so I'll leave it there and uh, welcome discussion. Thanks, Sharon. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's so much to unpack in this paper and you, uh, you hit all the highlights that uh, I think we have time to talk about. But one thing I wondered about clarifying is um, they talked about patients who uh, catastrophize and was that in the context of high anxiety? I can't quite remember. And how does that impact uh, any relation to, or does it relate to like death anxiety and worrying that they're going to have like horrible you know, symptoms that are difficult to control? And does that have any relation to desire to die? I find that quite interesting to explore further. Right. I don't recall um, the authors explicitly exploring that relationship between, you know, catastrophizing mm -hmm. and uh, death anxiety. Um, I, I wouldn't be uh, surprised that, that there would be um, uh, an association, uh, but they do give, uh, as, as you noted, some um, you know, strategies to uh, try to mitigate that tendency to catastrophize. Yeah, and was it the ones with high anxiety that were prone to catastrophizing? I don't know how the right how to pronounce that word exactly, but <laughs> it's a tough one. Um, again, I don't recall them explicitly saying, uh, but um, but yes, I would say it, so. Um, in our clinic, we we uh, often as, uh, administer a tool to assess catastrophizing more for in the pain context. So some patients will uh, bring a lot of uh, you know uh, emotional psychological uh, overlay into their pain experience, uh, and so those you know from my observation tend to be patients who express more anxiety uh, and or depression for that matter. Yeah, thanks. And please, uh, to our uh, or, um, our folks in the audience, could you please put any questions you have in the in the Q and A? And I'm wondering if Braden, if you have anything you would like to add about this paper. Um, I don't think that I have any particular points for this one, uh, to be honest. But it's really interesting, and I think it's something that is really important to look at further. So thank you for presenting that. Thanks. Yeah. For me, it speaks to the importance of doing routine screening for anxiety and depression in, in all of our patients so that we don't miss a way that we may need to adapt our care, as this article kind of suggests, and, and gives the practical tips and tools for to being able to better engage people and move beyond that. Um, their kind of res innate responses because of that overlay of anxiety and depression. So again, yeah, I really appreciate the practical tools and, and lots more to think about with with respect to uh, the death anxiety piece for me, for sure. Thanks, Sharon. Great, so I'm gonna present the next article, which is looking at uh, acute palliative care units, uh, the characteristics, activities, and outcomes of those on an international uh, level, and it's a scoping review by Sebastian Mercadanti and Eduardo Barrera. And it was just published in BMJ Supportive Palliative Care uh, in December. So by background, uh, they look at the history of um, palliative care units uh, being inpatient palliative care beds that allow palliative care specialists to treat patients with the most severe physical and psychosocial symptoms. They talk about how PCUs are lacking in most cancer hospitals and when, when present are predominantly hospice type beds for those approaching the end of their life. And uh, they go through some of the history, uh, which I'm gonna get uh, Sharon to comment on in a little bit, because uh, she is is works and uh, was involved in, in one of those pioneering acute palliative care units, which were originally developed in the 80s and 90s to provide symptom management for cancer-related comorbidities in an acute care setting 
fusing that palliative care philosophy with acute medical care and, and the um, therapies and investigations that are available in an acute medical care context uh, to the same standards of clinical competence and administrative regulation as any other medical or surgical inpatient unit. Those early APCUs like the one uh, in Edmonton, the tertiary palliative care unit there that Dr. Eduardo Brer founded, um, provided an inpatient palliative care program focused on intensive symptom management and resulting in improved quality of care and surprisingly reduced overall healthcare costs. I think surprisingly to some hospital administrators and, and um, to cancer care in general that they thought uh, there, there might be an increase in cost to having those types of units. But overall, they note that there's a lack of information and an understanding regarding what's kind of the current state of acute palliative care units internationally. Next slide, please. So in this scoping review, um, they assess the characteristics, activities, and outcomes of acute palliative care units. They used a PICO framework, uh, which stands for Patient Problem Intervention Comparing an Outcome. And they used the search term acute palliative care unit through the pub med database uh, through till the end of August 2022. Uh, they reviewed abstracts that met the inclusion and, ex and excluded um, exclusion criteria, and then additional records were retrieved by hand search cross references. And they reported the data following the PRISMA preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta analysis rules. So through that uh, methodology, they found, it, they found 18 studies that met the inclusion and exclusion criteria. And then they comprehensively looked through those studies to look at these parameters, reasons for the acute palliative care unit admission, referrals, discharge, destination, length of the APCU stay, changes in symptom intensity, and the mortality rate. Next slide, please. So under the reasons for acute palliative care ad admission, uh, across the international jurisdictions, uh, most people were admitted for symptom control. Uh, there's a smaller subset of people uh, who were admitted for cancer-related or cancer treatment-related complications. And care at the end of life accounted for less than um, a quarter of admissions with a big range from kind of 5 to 21 percent. And, and of course, in our Journal Watch program today, I don't have time to go through all of the details of their findings, but really encourage you to read the paper if you're intrigued. So uh, like in the last article, I'm just presenting kind of the high level summary. Um, when they looked at the admission referrals, uh, they found that in general, patients were referred from uh, inpatient and outpatient services, including uh, emergency rooms, other inpatient units, including internal medicine and oncology wards, oncology clinics, and palliative care clinics. Um, only one study included patients directly admitted from home. And there was quite a variation, actually, of patients who were admitted um, from the emergency room um, with um, like in uh, some of the countries in uh, the Arabian countries um, being higher admission rates from from eMERGE and some of the countries in North America being much lower admissions from eMERGE, so quite a spectrum. And we'll get to that in the, the discussion, but um, you know, certainly who comes and goes from the uh, APCUs may be directly influenced by the local resources outside of the acute care site and how patients with palliative care needs are being supported. Uh, so we'll chat about that in a bit. Um, discharge destinations included home, hospice, and other hospitals and long-term care. And uh, the death rates in, in the acute palliative care units typically ranged from 8 to 29%. So by and large, uh, most patients were being uh, discharged uh, a, a, alive to other settings of care. Uh, and except in the Arabian countries, so in, in Qatar and Saudi Arabia, uh, they were 60 and 86% respectively uh, who died there. The length of stay, uh, the mean length of stay was about six to 10 days, except in those two uh, Arabian countries that had significantly higher um, death rates, as we've discussed, where the mean length of stay was quite a bit longer at 25 to 30 days. Changes in symptom intensity were assessed across physical and psychological symptoms and all showed significant improvement in all of the studies they reviewed from baseline um, to discharge uh, from APCU. And overall, as I've mentioned earlier, the mean death rate was about 20%, except in those two countries in, in the Arabian states. So their key discussion points really talked about how overall 
currently, APCUs, although there's a broad spectrum of units internationally, um, the findings were quite different from inpatient hospice type units where patients in the APCUs were primarily admitted uh, for cancer requiring rapid pain and symptom stabilization, often still receiving anti-cancer treatment. Um, and that the vast majority of studies, most patients were discharged alive and they weren't functioning as a hospice type unit. Um, they discuss how the admissions and discharges were likely dependent on those local resources. So whether or not they had home care, um, how long to put home care in place might delay a discharge from the APCU um, if they had hospices available to have an alternate um, destination uh, for end of life care if a person was found at admission to APCU to be in a, in a, a, a state approaching end of life. They talked about how APCUs have an important role in the earlier provision of palliative care alongside treatments um, to cure or control uh, their cancer in particular, and um, that actually helps introduce the role of palliative care in that context um, as having, you know, much uh, important role to play earlier in the illness trajectory and can become involved intermittently uh, to address symptom crises. Um, they looked at how it, over a period of 10 years from 2010 to 2020 in the United States, only a quarter of the um, NCI designated centers had an acute palliative care unit and in the non-NCI, which is centers of excellence for, for cancer care in, in the US, um, in the ones that were not NCI designated, there was a much lower level of APCUs, but that over that 10 year period, there was no increase in the number of, of centers that were um, supporting acute palliative care units, despite the quality of care and the and healthcare costs being shown to be reduced in those. So, so not a lack, uh, you know, a lack of uptake on embedding this approach of acute palliative care units within comprehensive cancer centers. And then they advocate for um, acute palliative care units to be embedded within all cancer centers as a complementary um, care being provided um, not to replace hospice care and should not be become hospice care um, as part of the full spectrum of palliative care services being offered. They do discuss how in those are, um, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, where the death rates were much higher, there were, you know, other resources that weren't as readily available, such as hospices and other places to receive care. So that would certainly come into play with with the amount of folks who are admitted at end of life and provided um, care through to to death in that region. So overall strengths and limitations, um, it's a scoping review and of course only includes published data. It only included one Canadian acute care palliative care unit at the Princess Margaret Hospital in, in Toronto. Um, and we know that, uh, you know, there are a number of other acute palliative care units in, in Canada, including two of the pioneering units that were talked about in the introduction, the, the tertiary palliative care unit in Edmonton, and then the intensive palliative care unit um, in Calgary that was founded subsequently. Further studies are obviously needed to really understand the role of acute palliative care units. I think it's important, this article is important because it really describes the differences between PCUs in different countries and supports the value of distinguishing acute palliative care units from traditional hospice units and how they serve a complementary role in that broad um, spectrum of providing comprehensive cancer care in particular. It would be interesting to look at their role outside of cancer care and and that gets a bit more complicated uh, with with non cancer care, maybe we could talk about that with the other panelists. Um, and then I, I wanted to just add some context because the Canadian Atlas of Palliative Care that Palliative Canada is leading is working right now to capture palliative care unit services across the country and one of the indicators we're looking at is um, a death rate of greater than 50% as part of the definition of an acute palliative care unit. So it'll be interesting to see um, what role palliative care units in Canada are playing. Are they more hospice type or are they more acute palliative care unit type? Our pilot data for one region in Ontario shows that most PCUs currently are hospice type. Um, and using the Catalonia formula for the number of beds, uh, palliative care beds needed per 100,000 population, it is noted that two of the 10 recommended palliative care beds needed per 100,000 are recommended to be inpatient palliative care units. So it would be, again, interesting to think about in tertiary care uh, centers, cancer care centers, how many APCU beds are needed. So just some thoughts that I had, and I'd love to invite uh, Sharon and, and uh, Brayden to make some comments and any of you uh, who are joining us today to please put your questions in the Q&A. I don't know if you wanna go first, Brayden. 
Sure. Yeah, no, that's a great paper. I think the, uh, the part about the hospice beds and the ratio of uh, inpatient kind of acute palliative care beds to hospice is kind of eye opening. Um, here in Winnipeg, we have like 45 inpatient palliative care beds, like acute unit. Uh, and then we only have 16 hospice beds for all the whole city. Uh, so like there's like a three to one, you know, ratio in favor of the acute inpatient beds. Uh, whereas you're saying it should be like 80% kind of hospice to 20% palliative, like acute bed. Uh, so it's a huge discrepancy. And um, it's kind of been, a bit, you know, a bit of an issue in terms of like discharge planning and finding appropriate places for patients to go. Uh, when you only have 16 beds for the whole city, um, there's just so many patients admitted who, uh, who just really can't safely get home and we don't know the best location for them to go. Um, so this is like, yeah, really interesting paper and just highlights, uh, I think, what a big discrepancy there really is. So thank you. Any thoughts, Sharon? Yes, uh, agreed. And, and, and actually, I had not seen those um, uh, ratios of, of beds to population before. I think in, in Edmonton, we're pretty close to that. Like we have 20 for a population about a million. We have 20 acute inpatient uh, pelicare beds and about 85 hospice, I think. But we still find we don't have, um, we're short of hospice beds uh, is, is, the, is the perception uh, at least. Um, and yeah, the other thing I wondered about uh, in um, reading this paper, which they didn't look at was, was staffing. And I know the Canadian Society of Health Care Physicians has looked at staffing for, for different um, uh, uh, palliative care teams or units. And I, I wondered what your thoughts are on what would be optimal yeah. staffing. Yeah, exactly. So uh, as part of the staffing model, we did a re review of international literature to try to understand what the model would look like in acute palliative care units. And there is no guiding literature at all. Um, so we uh, recommended that it would be more in keeping with what you would do for other another acute medical care unit in terms of the nursing staffing. Um, and it should actually be uh, weighted based on, uh, I think, on, on patient complexity, right? As we all know, and we get patients that come to that this type of acute palliative care unit, they're total symptomatology and that total pain, um, total suffering is often very much at the forefront. That's why their their symptoms are so difficult to control and they may need APCU in the first place. And so they do take uh, somewhat a uh, time intensive care. So, so a typical like one to four acute care nursing ratio would not um, necessarily work because it may be that one patient actually in some situations needs one-to-one -one nursing because of their symptom crisis. So um, so I think we need to look at building um, a ratio of, at least from a nursing, like based on care intensity, as opposed to numbers of patients to staffing. Um, and, you know, the it, it certainly looked at, from a physician perspective, that it was more like one to six to 10 patients per physician. So for a 20 bed unit, I would, you know, our paper would suggest that we would need at least two physicians, of course, uh, in the context of an interprofessional team, which we know is required to provide holistic person centered care, especially in an APCU context to address all of those those symptoms. But those are just some initial thoughts. We do talk about that a little bit in the paper that's in the Journal of um, Palliative Medicine for those who are interested in interested in that. Great. Well, there's so much to talk about, but we've got to move on to our next paper. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Brayden to talk to us about dexamethasone. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to present a, a paper from the Journal of uh, Pain and Symptom Management. It was published in January of, of this year, uh, and it's titled Impact of Dosing and Duration of Dexamethasone on Serious Corticosteroid-Related Adverse Events. Uh, so just going through some of the key points from this article, uh, as we know, corticosteroids are widely used both in oncology as well as within palliative care. Uh, we use them all the time for symptom management. Um, despite this, we really have a bit of a lack of evidence in terms of what is the optimal dose of these medications as well as duration, and risks of adverse effects is often lacking, especially within the context of our population. Uh, so many of the side effects we often look at with corticosteroids are related to non-cancer patients and prolonged use, so maybe not as relevant when you're looking at a life-limiting illness uh, and the doses that we may use in our patients as well. Uh, so this study was a secondary analysis 
uh, looking at the effects of de dexamethasone on dyspnea in cancer patients. So the name of that initial trial was the ABCD trial, which stood for alleviating breathlessness in cancer patients with dexamethasone. Uh, so the primary outcome of this paper was looking at grade three plus adverse effects. And then other things they looked at were secondary outcomes, including any grade adverse event that occurred, as well as what were the most common adverse events as well. Next slide, thank you. Uh, so going through the methods that were used in the overall study design and some of those key details. Uh, so looking at the original ABCD trial, um, which they then performed the secondary analysis on for this paper, uh, in that initial trial, patients were randomized in a two to one ratio uh, to receive dexamethasone eight milligrams by mouth twice daily for one week, followed by four milligrams twice daily for seven days, or they were give, given a matching placebo. So it was either that whole course of steroids, so a 14-day course, or it was matching placebo for 14 days uh, in a two-to-one ratio. Uh, patients then, after that point, could decide if they wanted to partake in an open-label um, phase of the study. So if they chose to continue, they'd get a four milligrams of dexamethasone twice a day for another seven days, followed by two milligrams a day by mouth for, uh, sorry, twice daily for an additional week, and then they would stop the steroid. Uh, so throughout this entire process, there was weekly assessments to determine adherence and response to the steroid, as well as recording any adverse event, uh, events that occurred uh, up to six weeks of follow-up occurred. Uh, in terms of the study population, uh, this was from MD Anderson Cancer Center, as well as Lyndon B. Johnson uh, Hospital General Oncology Clinic. So that's in Houston, Texas. And it occurred between January 2017 and April 2021. Uh, so within this study, patients were divided into four groups uh, based on their total dexamethasone exposure. So there was kind of a graded exposure um, depending on the group, which was sort of helpful in terms of analysis and seeing dose-related ad adverse events. So in group A, these had the highest exposure over four weeks, which was an average of 256 milligrams. Uh, group B had an average of 168 milligrams over two weeks. Uh, group C, an uh, average of 88 milligrams over two weeks. And then there was the placebo group who had no exposure. So those were the patients in the original trial who were randomized to placebo. And then in the open phase of the study, they chose not to continue on steroids. So they got no exposure at all. And they were sort of used as a control group then. Uh, they used multivariable lo uh, logistic regression modeling uh, to find significant difference in the frequency of adverse events between the groups. Next slide, please. So going through the findings, this is a little bit of a, a wordy graph here, but uh, we'll kind of break it down. Uh, there was 119 patients total. Uh, so then there was those four groups, as mentioned, with group A having 32 patients. Those had the most dexamethasone exposure over over the study time frame, uh, 47 patients in group B, 20 in group C, and 20 in group D. And group D was that placebo group with no, no steroid exposure at all. Uh, when they looked at the results, out of the 119 patients total, uh, 99 of them, so 83%, had any grade adverse event. Uh, 38 of 119, so 32% of patients had grade three adverse events, um, which was one of the primary outcomes they were looking at. And then 23% of patients required hospitalization. Uh, when they looked at kind of how frequent those more severe adverse events occurred, so the, the grade three plus, uh, they occurred in 65% of patients in group A, so with the highest exposure to steroid, versus 25% of patients in group B, 15% uh, in group C, and then 15% uh, in group D. Uh, of note, when grade one or two adverse events occurred, so sort of deemed more mild adverse events, uh, those tended to occur within the first couple of weeks of steroid exposure, whereas the more severe adverse events, so grade three plus or hospitalizations, those had a bit of a later onset. So the median onset was 20 days for uh, grade three plus adverse events and 26 days for hospitalization. So kind of a bit of a delayed uh, term of uh, in terms of looking at the steroid dose and when you might see those effects, it was later than the more mild side effects. Um, statistically significant differences among treatment groups, um, having grade three plus adverse events, hospitalization and insomnia. 
And something they noted in the article was that group A had an odds ratio of 15.1 uh, in experiencing grade three adverse events uh, compared to no exposure to steroid at all. Now that had a pretty wide confidence interval because it's a fairly low number of patients. So the range there was 1.4 to 160, but it worked out to a 15.1 odds ratio. Uh, grade three uh, plus adverse events occurred um, a median of 20 days, as I stated, uh, after exposure. And they did note as well that there was a high rate of infection uh, in the highest exposure group, so group A, and that was 29% of patients, although because of the low number of patients in the trial, it wasn't statistically significant. And they also noted that neuropsychiatric symptoms, which can be things like delirium, depression, restlessness, psychosis, uh, those occurred a median of 10 days after exposure. Uh, and there was a higher incidence with, with increased doses of steroid and longer duration of use. Uh, and the last point here is that insomnia occurred in 31% of patients uh, with a median onset of only seven days. And that's despite this trial uh, counseling patients to take their late, latest dose of steroid by two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, there were still high rates of insomnia. Uh, so some key discussion points from this article. Um, the most common adverse events included insomnia, dyspepsia, neuropsychiatric symptoms, as I previously mentioned, as well as infection. Uh, and the higher incidence of adverse events uh, in this trial compared to others. So they kind of find, found higher numbers throughout. And they thought this could be due to higher doses of the steroids that were used compared to other trials that have been done before, as well as longer duration. And they did have quite a long period of follow-up for up to six weeks as well. Uh, so some studies were more limited and only had a few weeks of follow-up. This had six weeks. And they had really vigilant kind of rigorous monitoring as well with weekly or yeah, sorry, I think uh, very common uh, that they were getting checked in on for any side effects. There might have been high reporting rates uh, compared to other trials as well. Uh, one important point to consider is that this population, because of the original study being on effective steroids for dyspnea, that the baseline population all had dyspnea, at least moderate severity. Uh, and so they may have had other comorbid conditions compared to different studies looking at steroid use. Um, one discussion point was that as prescribers, we should be cautious when we're using doses of like greater than eight milligrams a day of dexamethasone, uh, as they definitely noted some significant risk of serious adverse events or hospitalization. So in terms of some additional uh, comments or points from the article, um, it is difficult to draw firm conclusions when it comes to the dosing as well as the length of steroid use. Um, but I thought it was a helpful study in terms of highlighting the importance of really reassessing our use of steroids frequently and using the lowest dose possible for the shortest duration as well. Uh, it's, I find it's one of those medications that can sort of be started and then uh, it's something in the background you're not always reassessing or thinking about. So it really just, for me, highlighted the importance of considering always reassessing and does the patient truly need this medication. Um, I thought that research looking at effects of frequent pulse dosing might be helpful. Um, so for example, maybe there's a particular time frame of being off dexamethasone or other steroids that your risk of adverse events will sort of return close to baseline. Uh, but this study didn't look at pulse dosing. It was sort of prolonged dosing of steroid. <clears throat> In terms of st uh, study strengths, uh, this was a double-blinded RCT, which is great. Um, it looked at steroid side effects in the context of advanced cancer, which is quite relevant to our patients that we see. And it was nice as well that it had the four groups with different exposures to steroid, including a placebo group that had no exposure at all. Some limitations of this study uh, is that it was a relatively small sample size with 119 patients. Uh, it was limited to the outpatient setting, so maybe not as generalizable to inpatient unit. Uh, and it had Although pretty good follow-up of 42 days, there still could be things that were missed with only that six weeks of follow-up. Uh, another limitation that I, I sort of thought as I read through this was uh, the inclusion of that open label phase of the study where patients would have that choice of if they want to continue on the steroid or not. Uh, you know, it's possible that the patients who had increased disease or symptom burden may have been the ones who kind of self-selected to continue the steroid versus not. Uh, and maybe those same patients could be at higher risk of adverse events from being on the steroid. Uh, in addition, the study was only from one site in Texas. So 
hard to know if it's completely generalizable to the broader patient population. And lastly, why is this article important? Uh, as we all know, we use steroids very frequently with a variety of indications, um, often in sort of an acute crisis, and then we look to lower the dose over time and come off of that medication. Uh, there was limited research in terms of side effects that's really relevant to palliative care. Uh, and this study showed that there are risks of high dose and prolonged dexamethasone. Uh, and I think that this info could help kind of guide informed decision making with patients when we're looking at risk benefit of our medications. Great. Thanks so much, Braden. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you could clarify something in the study design methodology for Valerie. So she uh, has just put a question that she's confused about the dosing times because in the article and on the slide, it said uh, that the dosing was every 12 hours, but no dose was given past uh, 2 p.m. Mm. Uh, because of insomnia uh, or potential to interfere with sleep. Um, so she's just curious if that means they were getting dosed at two in the morning and two in the afternoon. Yeah. Uh, do you I, do you, do you see anything in the paper that clarified that? Uh, good point. Yeah, that may have been a bit of an error with my slide here. I'm just sorry. I just opened up the original study, and uh, it looks like actually they mentioned in the initial methodology. I apologize because it looks like it was BID, and I put it as Q12H in my slides. So that's yeah. a good a good pickup there. It looks like it was a BID dosing, not a Q12H dosing. Yeah, uh, actually, and uh, I see under methods, it's, it is every 12 hours. So I think the error is on, yeah. on their part. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. well, then I'll blame yeah. them. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I suspect it was exact, exactly meant to be BID. Um, yeah. And then she wanted to know if there's any data on how the patients felt as far as their dyspnea, which is probably the first publication, but um, whether the dyspnea was improved and whether it was worth the experience of side effects. Yeah, that's, that's a good question um, because, yeah, this study was looking at that secondary analysis. Um, to be honest, I didn't look back at the original to see kind of what the effects were on dyspnea, uh, but that would be something good to look at to sort of weigh, like, what is the benefit or what's the trade-off? Uh, so, yeah, that's something I intend to look at in the future for sure. Great. Um, Sharon, did you want to add any comments? And then I'll go to our last question. And uh, Actually, I was going to... Uh, um bring up the, 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 the PPI question, Perfect. because <laughs> which I see that uh, Jeremy had put in the uh, question and answer box. Uh, yes, yes. So I, I was interested to see uh, that dyspepsia was one of the um, uh, more frequent adverse events. Uh, and uh, the, the, the authors, I think, did say that there's um, insufficient evidence at this point to recommend that PPIs be used uh, uh, routinely. Uh, but uh, it's something definitely worth considering, especially yeah. in those patients who may have pre-existing uh, upper GI issues. Yeah, and Brayden, did they comment on GI bleed? I thought it was just dyspepsia, just to clarify that. Yeah, and I think there was a note in the article um, stating that no patients had any sort of severe right. GI bleed. Um, that would have been something they were monitoring for, but no patients had that outcome, as far as I recall. Uh, so yeah, that that's why it wasn't really discussed more. And then there was the note, sorry, you cut out my internet connection, was a little unstable there for a second. But yeah, in terms of um, PPI, I think they said that there's other studies showing that there's not really evidence in the outpatient ambulatory setting of giving routine uh, prophylaxis with PPI in terms of GI bleed risk, but that in the inpatient setting, uh, they stated in the paper that there is evidence of giving PPI. Great. So I, I don't know if that's a repeat from what you said. You cut out for a second there. So <laughs> yeah, I no worries. Okay. Thanks. Great. Well, uh, we're going to move on to our last article. So machine learning over to you, Sharon. Yes, so um, this comes from our palliative care colleagues in Ontario. And uh, so the premise for the study is that I, I think this audience is probably aware that um, uh, research has shown that uh, early specialist palliative care consultation for patients with advanced cancer has multiple benefits. And some uh, organizations such as American Society of Clinical Oncology have advocated for routine uh, consultation within eight weeks of diagnosis of advanced disease. However, uh, the concern has been expressed uh, that uh, there are a limited uh, number of uh, palliative care specialists, and so it may make more sense to adopt a more targeted approach to um, consultation. So machine learning is um, a subfield of artificial intelligence where uh, a machine uh, imitates um, intelligent uh, human behavior. So uh, these authors wanted to apply that technology to um, clinical 
critical decision making, uh, and specifically to see if a machine learning system could help to identify those patients who would die within a year and therefore uh, be appropriate for a specialist palliative care consultation. And they wanted to look at the impact on the timing of, uh, uh, of consultation and on the number of consultations. So they looked at uh, administrative health databases in Ontario, and the uh, population were those patients who were on palliative intense systemic therapy uh, between uh, June 2014 and December 2019, there were some um, significant exclusions. For example, uh, no patients with hematological disease, no patients on clinical trial, no patients on hormone therapy, no mm -hmm. patients on uh, oral systemic therapy, because it was more difficult to uh, capture that in the available databases. And they divided the uh, that population into a development cohort uh, on which develop their learning mm -hmm. machine learning system and then a test cohort um, and uh, and they used July 2017 as the cutoff so anyone who had their first treatment before 20 uh, July 2017 was in the development cohort everyone who had their treatment afterwards was in the test cohort and so what they did was um, uh, they fed uh, um, in their development cohort they uh, fed this machine learning system uh, some data so they fed in demographic acute care use, cancer diagnosis and treatment, symptoms, functional status and lab values. And so they told this machine, so develop a system to identify patients who are going to die within a year after their first treatment. And uh, so they uh, looked at different iterations of uh, this model and they, they, they chose one and then they tested it in the um, uh, uh, the the uh, um, uh, their uh, other cohort, their test cohort, to see how did this model actually perform, and how did it do compared to what actually happened in terms of timing and um, uh, uh, number of consultations. And in their uh, in this study, any palliative care consult that happened more than six months before death was considered as early. And those that occurred more than two years before death, they considered as too early. So next slide, please. So uh, they included 54,000 patients uh, and they found that their um, this machine learning system did a good job of predicting who is going to die within a year. And then they looked at, uh, so what in that test cohort, so uh, what actually happened in terms of um, timing of the specialist palliative care consultation? So what they found was that uh, only 15% uh, of patients in that test cohort actually got their consultation more than six months before death, and 12% had it more than uh, two years before death. So then they looked, what would have happened if they had implemented this machine learning system? And they saw that the number of patients uh, who had that early specialist palliative care increased by 8.5%. So a total of 23% uh, you know, of that population had that early consultation. And for those who got it too early, that increased by only 2.1%. And the other finding was that when they looked at the total number of consultations to palliative care, the total number did not increase with the implementation of machine learning system. They just were uh, found earlier. So there, uh, the discussion was that the performance uh, of this system, uh, what's novel is that they're looking at an entire population in Ontario, uh, and they acknowledged that this was a prognostic-based system. They didn't look at other triggers for palliative care consultation. They did warn that with machine learning, there's also always a risk of introducing bias if the data that, they're, that the, the machine is learning to develop their model is, um, if that data is biased and that bias will come through in their model, uh, and uh, um, and they are uh, advocate for uh, implementing and evaluating these sort of machine learning prognostic sy systems in identifying patients for specialist palliative care. Next uh, slide. So strengths population-based, methodologically rigorous, the limitations, there are key exclusions in their patient population. They don't look at other triggers for specialist palliative care, such as high symptom burden. Uh, it doesn't 
although the total amount of consultations did not increase, they didn't account for follow-ups. So if you see a patient earlier going to probably need to do more follow-up visits uh, and it does have to uh, be validated. So I guess for me, um, the main point takeaway is that one of our fears as, as specialist palliative care uh, consultants is that um, uh, by implementing systematic referrals uh, that will overwhelm us. And this, uh, in terms of volume of referrals and this um, uh, study suggests that that might not be the case. However, further research and, and validation is needed before we draw that conclusion. Thanks, Sharon. Uh Again, like lots we could talk about in this article, and we we are short on time, but I think I, I was most surprised by that last um, finding as well, that it didn't increase the overall number of consults. So I think there's definitely more work to be done to understand how to best apply machine learning and AI and palliative care in terms of identification of patients and what that means for both generalist and specialist level palliative care. Um, Braden, do you, would you like to make any quick comments and then we'll move on to the honorable mentions out of the interest of time. Yeah, not, not too much. I mean, I think that's just like such a unique area that's kind of coming to light lately and wondering how we're going to navigate AI in general. But yeah, if there's ways to implement it to get kind of more appropriate consults early on, I think that's really a positive thing. And yeah, I agree. That's interesting that the total number of consults didn't actually go up, um, but maybe just kind of more appropriate. Uh, but yeah, the importance, like you said, of like uh, the ongoing follow-up and what would that actually look like long-term. But I just thought it's a really quite a unique article. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, I, I look forward to seeing what how this evolves, because uh, I think that's there is going to be a bigger place for machine learning in many of our practices. So making sure we um, do it in the right way, I guess, right? So yeah, very thanks for so much for presenting that. So we had three other papers that we wanted you to take a look at uh, that we that would be of interest and would really help us improve the way we think about palliative care. Uh, you'll see them here on the slide. The first one is an article looking at the influence of the oral microbiome on patterns of oral mucositis in, um, in terms of the severity in patients with squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck. Uh, the second one is looking at improving access for palliative care for people experiencing socioeconomic inequities, findings from a community-based pilot research study. And then the third one is looking at a default palliative care consultation for seriously ill hospitalized patients, a prag pragmatic cluster randomized control trial. So you can get those references um, through our uh, Journal Watch website. And in conclusion, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for joining us uh, for today's Journal Watch session and to both Sharon and Brayden for their work to present today. In the spirit of continuous improvement, we'd love to get your feedback on how you felt the session went. Please fill out the feedback survey. Uh, the link has been sent to you in the chat. Uh, as mentioned at the beginning, a recording of this session will also be emailed to all registrants within the next week. Thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you at our next session. And a big shout out to all of our Journal Watch contributors across all of the universities you can see here. Uh, we couldn't do it without this amazing team. Thank you so much. Have a great day.